My name is Miko. Um, today I'll be giving a lecture on how to speak member. Uh, a few, I guess, uh, words of discussion before I start. The first is that I'm going to be making a lot of distinctions here. But admittedly, a lot of these distinctions have a lot of gray area. Uh, there's a lot of overlap. So I don't want you to think of these as hard definitions or as... Um, so I'm going to be discussing things like types of extensions, etc. I don't want you to think about the categories too much. The end goal of these distinctions is just to make sure that this is as digestible and as easy to follow as possible but also that it guides your thought process when you're trying to think of an extension, to look at it at one aspect or another. Don't be too caught up in what kind of extension you might be running because ultimately that doesn't have any impact on the debate. It'll really just be judged as it is. The second is that um, I'm going to be trying as much as possible to integrate examples, but a lot of this is a lot easier said than done. So a lot of this is theoretical. A lot of this will talk about like potential scenarios and things like that. But in an actual debate, a lot more things change. Uh, the way we're going to talk about it now is a far more controlled scenario where I might just talk about it with one team or two teams rather than all four teams. Uh, it's important to, one, get a lot of practice as much as possible. Nothing really beats experience. So this will only really serve as a guide. But number two, to make sure you can adapt to whatever changing situations there are. That being said, um, There'll be three main parts of this. The first is I'm going to talk about general tips. So some ground rules, I guess, before we get into the different types of extensions, which is the second part. And I'm making these types not because I want, again, you to hard code the kinds of extensions there are, but to think about or have a structure as to what you could possibly do within a debate to come up with a new extension. Consider this aspect or another aspect or another way of extending as that might be more strategic. The last is just positioning. So a lot of people will come up with a new extension and a lot of the time they're very potent. They could possibly win the debate, but because of poor positioning or without being able to explain why it is the most important case being made in the round, they don't end up taking a first tech they could take third or fourth as a result. So a few general tips. My first is always do not be afraid to let go of prep. It is very difficult, I think, once you've built an entire argument, once you've spent the entire PM or LO speech trying to build a set of cases that seem like you're already quite attached to them. But a lot of the time, if opening has run even 75% of the argument you wanted to run, it is probably time to let go of that argument. Um, and it's difficult because it's difficult to adjust it around. It's difficult to think of things on the fly. But the faster that you recognize that you cannot run an argument anymore, the faster you can also spend as much time as possible coming up with new things and being able to adjust. And believe me when I say that, no matter at what stage of debating you are, there will be opening teams who will seem like they just absolutely take everything and they burn so much ground. You have to be willing to recognize that and not just hope that people forget because a lot of judges will see right through you trying to pretend it's a new extension when it really isn't. Even if there's new material in there or some degree of new analysis, if it's not close to the gravity that your opening has or it's not winning enough, it's probably not like time to let go of that argument. The second is the prep for speaking extension. And I guess this goes hand in hand with the first one. You will have to worry a lot less about letting go of your prep if you prep for trying to extend. What does that mean? There are some motions where the opening case is just obvious. You are quite sure as to what they're going to run. You ought to forget about that already. There's little to no hope of you being able to run that unless your opening forgets. And that's two things or two scenarios there. The first is either they end up running it and then you're correct and it was good for you to, not, or to anticipate them running it and you've thought of other stuff already. Or they don't end up running it. In that case, if it was so blatantly obvious to you that they were going to run it, I'm quite sure you could be, like, you have the capacity to build that in a relatively short amount of time. So in either instance, whether in the vast majority of cases where they run it or in the minority of cases where they don't end up running it, you're probably quite solved. But it's much, much better to account for the worst case and just think of a lot of the other stuff that you would have to run when opening already takes all the pretty obvious things. And 
take note that extension isn't just coming up with a new argument. It's understanding how to frame it, how to position it, and knowing how it fits into the debate. And the sooner that you can think of that, even from prep and having the foresight to look at what the debate is likely to turn out into, will already give you a good chance of winning the round. Uh, the third thing here is really just communicate with your whip. Uh, I think a whip can do three things. The first is to respond to the other side in ways that would disprove their arguments. I think this is an important thing to do and will definitely be quite crucial in a round. However, it will never solely win you the round. All it does, I would say, is it lowers the chances of other teams being able to win the round, especially the ones you're responding to. However, you look at the case as a whole and you look at the team as a whole. And in so far as a lot of these responses are not tied to the extension, it's not likely that these responses are going to change the way that your team as a whole is viewed. So maybe that's plus one or two speaker points for your whip. It's not going to bring you above fourth or third. So why is communication important then? I think there are two more things that a whip can do that are pretty important. The first is they can respond in ways that are logically derivative of the extension. And what that does is it makes the extension look like it's a lot more engaging, look like it is the answer to a lot of the problems that the government or opposition, wherever you might be, teams are trying to like say are big problems that the other side doesn't really solve. The third is the whip could actually just frame the argument. They could say, well, all the arguments in this round are true, but assuming that were the case, this argument is the most important argument that would exist in the debate. And if that's the case, it's very important for your whip to know what the extension is. So I would highly recommend in the downtime between every speaker, explain to your whip, here's what our extension is. If it hasn't changed, you can say something as simple as hasn't changed, right? But in the instance that it has, explain what the new extension is or ways in which it has developed. So it's not often as clear cut as you either have the exact same extension or you have completely changed the extension. But your whip should know a lot of these smaller details as to how it has changed, whether you prioritize one argument more, whether you're going to change the way it was framed or built, etc. So always communicate with your whip. Similarly, once you're done with your speech, don't just give your whip your rebuttals. Give your whip pieces of framing that you are unable to explain in your speech because these might also prove to be crucial, especially because either MO or GovWhip is speaking after you. If you have new ways to counter frame the way these two new speakers are trying to frame, that's quite important then. So all of the types of extensions, I think there are broadly two. And there is the vertical extension and there is the horizontal extension. So a vertical extension, and before I move on to that actually, I think there are actually broadly a couple of kinds of debates as well. And the better extension to take is often the extension that is more apt for the debate at hand. So I think there is type one debates where, and I, I, there are many other ways to frame it, but pretty much type one debates are ones with all the same conclusions, all the same arguments. And a closing team doesn't really have much hope in trying to come up with a wild new argument to be able to win the debate. Rather, they often win on the basis of a very compelling mechanism to be able to prove the same conclusions the entire bench has been saying, or a very compelling characterization that explains how important an argument is or a, uh, an actor is in the debate, and therefore that wins them the round. So for example, um, this house would allow, um, say this house would allow uh, inmates who are like, I guess, the simple wording of the motion would be this has to allow inmates who are in line for the death penalty to opt, or rather, no, sorry, inmates who are in line for life imprisonment to opt for euthanasia or corporal punishment. So I think there's honestly not many outcomes you can say in that debate. Um, you could maybe talk about how it impacts their families at most in extension, but I don't think that becomes particularly important. It'll really just be down to what is better, life in prison or um, you know, being able to opt for some life-ending treatment as uh, instead. And I think in these debates, you have to focus then on characterization. You have to focus on your illustration. You have to focus on different mechanisms to explain why one life would be better than the other. And it won't come with a new impact. 
and being able to read that the debate is that way, I think is quite important. Similarly, however, I think there are debates that are so wide ranging, have a million impacts, and there are so many ways to extend. What that means is there are many ways for you to differentiate yourself from your opening. And it's now a matter of you're probably going to have some new conclusion, but are you going to have more important conclusions that your opening is going to take? So let's say, I would say a lot of philosophical motions would have to take on this kind of thing. So let's say it's a motion such as this house prefers a world without the concept of an afterlife. I think there are many ways to explain what an afterlife does. I think it could change the way people experience life and get meaning out of it. I think it could change how moral systems work and whether or not people are incentivized or apathetic towards doing good and doing evil. I think it could change the way that people, I guess, perceive hope and optimism and pessimism and like existentialism and all these different things. I think on opening and closing, there are a million arguments you could probably run. It's now a matter of being able to frame the arguments as far more important. And I have a bit of a scale here on the right side. On the top is you have engagement with the opening slash rehash potential, and you have unique material slash box out potential. So these are opposite ends of the spectrum. Meaning, so there's already an opening debate that happened before you. You could fully engage with the opening debate that happened. Well, that also means you're probably treading a lot of the same line that your opening team has already said. So the more engaging or as fully engaging you are, maybe engagement's not the right word, but in the sense that you're trying to imitate a lot of the opening debate, there's also a high chance you're rehashing your opening team. Similarly, your material could be completely new, but could be completely boxed out of the debate as well. And being able to read what kind of debate it is, whether it's a debate one in characterization or a debate one of the number of impacts, also informs definitely you want to take some middle point of this scale. But I would say you often don't have to take a, like just specifically the middle point itself, but maybe leading towards one side or another. So in a debate where there's so many different conclusions, I don't think it's likely that you can actually get boxed out because every team will have a completely different frame. It's not a matter of being able to prove your own frame. Similarly, in a debate with all of the same conclusions, if you argue something just radically out of there, there's high likelihood you box out. And it might be better to tread a lot of the same line as your opening might, but introduce a lot of new things as well that are deemed to be important in the debate. So you want to make sure that whatever point of this scale that you're trying to take, you're taking the one that's the most strategic for what debate you're opting into. And what I'm going to do now is look at different types of vertical extensions and horizontal extensions how you can do them, and I guess how to be able to position them in the debate after. So some vertical extensions. Um, one way to extend vertically is to have a newer context slash problem. Um, so for example, does the new context you introduce change the urgency of the argument? And does the new context change how the argument manifests? What I'm saying here is you only opt for this kind of extension if it actually changes either of these two things. Does it make the argument more important? Does it change how the argument works? Otherwise, your opening is just going to get away with the win. And as I've said before, um, these are very, like these are the distinctions I am drawing as lines in the sand. You can extend vertically in all the categories I am saying, um, and that would still be a vertical extension. I'm just saying unique ways to be able to do it. So don't think that there's a context extension and you will only extend on the context. You can extend on that and the other vertical extensions I'm gonna talk about. It is precisely mix, uh, mixing and matching them that I think would be the most strategic. So for example, you have the motion, this house believes that in areas of social economic deprivation, schools should train students in vocational skills to the exclusion of the liberal arts. Uh, let's say you are on government side of the debate and people are simply saying that, well, Schools should train students in vocational uh, skills because this is precisely, um, let's say, what people can afford. It is the skills that require a lot less personal and individual investment, etc. What would help you here with the context extension is that there's a context implied in the motion, which says that 
that's an area of social economic deprivation. And what I would say here is these areas often have little competitive advantage over other areas. So even if you taught them the liberal arts and the liberal arts were good, your liberal arts schools would not be able to compete with the wealthier liberal arts schools that exists in maybe uh, urban, uh, urban areas, in city capitals, etc. And therefore, the better method of development that you ought to take is being able to specialize in vocational skills so that other cities that are lessening the number of manufacturing jobs that they have, for example, start to move their labor towards your city. So that's why the context here becomes important because it becomes a point of strategic advantage beyond just the opening. So I, I might be giving a few bad arguments here just to highlight what the extension is. But let's say your opening is just like, well, people can't really afford it. That's all they really know. Um, it's very difficult because the other skills require a lot of personal investment. That might not be as compelling as explaining what the specific and strategic method of development might be for the context that you're working in. And this works for a lot of other debates that don't necessarily have a context. So on opposition, for example, Op could argue, um, for example, just that, well, that allows people in your socially or socioeconomically deprived area to move out of the city and work somewhere else. Um, on CO, though, you might be able to explain that, well, vocational skills and the context of the day is that they're becoming increasingly unimportant not just because there are so many places that they can provide them, but also because there's a rising trend of automation that makes it less and less valuable to have a lot of vocational and like, uh, like I guess, technique workers. And that kind of context already to an extent disproves the benefit that government tries to bring in the debate. So being able to explain both implied contexts by the motion or just context in the world today I think help overall explain the urgency and importance of an argument. The second type of vertical extension is just the mechanistic extension. So there are two ways to do it. The first is simply, if your opening didn't prove how it's going to happen, or they have a very like flimsy way of proving it, then you can just completely claim the benefit and say, well, our mechanism is the only way to prove it. You can't credit that to opening. Or let's say opening does an okay job of proving it, but you have a new mechanism that explains that you could do it even better. So what that does is you can't just say, well, opening has mechanism one, we have mechanism two. Otherwise, I am just more inclined to let opening take the win. You have to say that your mechanism two somehow makes the argument better. Does it make it faster? Does it make the benefit larger? Does it impact more people as a result of your mechanism? So let's take this example. This house supports decapitation as a strategy in taking down terrorist organizations. Now, uh, just to explain a bit, decapitation is being able to take down the heads of terrorist organizations um, as opposed to, I guess, more collective approaches that go from the bottom up. Let's say you are on, um, let's say you're on opposition and you oppose decapitation and your end goal is to be able to reach some negotiation here. Your opening opposition argues, well, if you have decapitation, you're likely to antagonize these terrorist groups and they're less likely to come to the negotiating table as a result of the strategy that you've taken. Therefore, you don't get negotiation on your side. Maybe CG is smart. CG points it out and says, on both sides, any response that is anti-terrorist is going to be necessarily antagonistic and therefore they won't come to the negotiating table regardless. What you could say on CO is, we agree, right? Um, OO has a faulty mechanism because they just say antagonizing any terrorist organization is bad. What I will explain is why heads of the terrorist organizations are often massively incentivized and have the capacity to go to the negotiating table. And that's for many reasons, right? Number one, heads of the terrorist organization probably have a degree of collecting and consolidating interest rather than having, without these heads, the very diffused, very chaotic nature of a terrorist organization without a leader who is unable to represent in, in meetings, in dealings, in negotiations, and therefore make it impossible to deal with multiple different people as a government or as a state trying to 
you know, bargain with them to do a ceasefire, for example, or that they have an incentive to do it. Precisely because as a head of the organization, you're completely aware as to what the state of the organization is. Are we winning? Are we losing? And therefore, a lot of the time, you want to either l- bargain when you have an advantage or be able to stop stem the bleeding when you're at a disadvantage and therefore will use the consolidated organizational interest as a whole to be able to negotiate and therefore you go to the negotiating table. But whenever we kill these leaders, it goes into disarray because now we don't know who's the representative because now we don't have anyone who is willing to put together the collected interests of the organizational structure as a whole and put them to the negotiating table. And that's how we get negotiation. We have to keep these heads alive. That is far better than the opening argument because it relies on you not antagonizing them and on either side to antagonize them. So that's why the mechanistic extension works. The flow of opening here is that they actually just don't get the benefit at all. And therefore, you have to prove that you can get it then at closing opposition. Next, you can have a characterization extension. So does the characterization change the way actors behave or give reasons as to why an actor will act one way or another? So let's say you have the motion, this house regrets the rise of China as a global superpower. I swear to God, there are so many versions of this debate and almost all the time opening, we'll just give various different examples of why US is good and China is bad or why US is bad and why China is good. But it's very rare or it's often just in the closing half that you see some degree of a cohesive characterization to explain the incentives and behaviors of both sides. So one thing I could say here is, let's say we're on Gov. And OG just tells China that all these bad things in the past, they have that trap. Uh, no, sorry, let's say we're on OP rather. Uh, China did all these good things in the past. They uh, funded states that previously did not receive any loans, like countries in Central Asia. Uh, like countries in Africa that other large superpowers are never able to touch. Uh, They did X, Y, Z things. And it's difficult to do that because a lot of the time, Gov will just say, well, the U.S. is starting to do that too. Other countries are starting to do that too, etc. What you could say at CO is give more compelling and more like holistic characterization. To say something like China as an actor is apolitical meaning that it often does not require them to meddle within your internal politics as a country. We've seen the way that other superpowers have forced themselves and imposed themselves on your country that China never does. So the US-led IMF has often led the neoliberal policies that harm countries that are unable to keep up with large free trade agreements because they don't have strong industries. Or the US in the Middle East often imposes some degree of quote-unquote democracy, which means that well, which is often incompatible when you just force it and shove it into the local culture and therefore leads them to resent democracy, even if it could have possibly worked had you tried to integrate it more into the kinds of like local cultures. So characterization becomes important because it gives credence to the, I guess, va- uh, values or it outcomes that occur within the debate. And I think it's particularly important to have strong characterization extensions when motions revolve around specific actors. So if a motion will talk about children, you have to characterize children quite well. If a motion will revolve around specific countries, you have to explain how those countries behave and what their incentives are. And overall, those are how I think, at least, you take the win in those debates. Uh, I guess the last example I have of vertical extension is the development of the principle. So. A lot of the time, there are banner statements to explain a principle. You have a right to life, a right to free speech, a right to X, Y, Z. But they are often not argued in specific, meaning any debate will obviously have some rights being defended on both sides. It's a matter of to what extent is this right supposed to be followed? To what extent should it no longer be honored? And I think you want to discuss the rights that exist in line with the nuances of the motion. So let's say the motion is, this house believes that the UN should intervene in countries with a severe humanitarian crisis. OG says, well, the UN is a global organization that means it should have the right to be able to meddle in the affairs of, around the globe. OO says, well, that doesn't stop individual countries from having the right and ability 
to exercise their own personal sovereignty. And the problem with these two arguments is they don't engage what the specificities of emotion are and what the context of a humanitarian crisis is. So if I'm on CG, I would say this is correct because a humanitarian crisis also harms the sovereignty of other nations in many ways. Number one, if there's a humanitarian crisis in one nation, that often means people flee that nation and have to go to neighboring countries or wherever is best for them to be able to survive. And these shifts in refugees and migration often are increased loads on these countries to be able to manage. And that's not anyone's fault. It's not the fault of the refugees. It's not the fault of these countries. Rather, you could argue that it's the fault of the individual governments who we did not or did not have the capacity to intervene in because of the excuse of sovereignty. So therefore, because their sovereignty harms the sovereignty of other countries, we should have the capacity and right to intervene in these areas. So that's one way that you can explain a principle that interacts with the nuances of the motion that exists then. Let's move on to horizontal extensions. So a simple way to do it is just to introduce a new actor. Um, when Oh, sorry, I, I forgot to change it. But introducing a new actor is important in two ways. Either you explain the actor is a very big, very powerful, and very impactful actor, and they can change the way the debate operates, or you can do the opposite. You can say that it impacts a very vulnerable group, and therefore, they should be the priority and should be protected in the debate. So let's say it's this house regrets U.S. intervention in Syria. Government argues U.S. intervention was done very poorly. Uh, it uh, angered locals. It fractured rebel groups. It did not have sustained commitment, etc. At closing government, you could explain, well, actually, OG does not talk about a very impactful actor here. It is Russia, and the strengthening of Russian support in favor of the Assad government because they had to use Syria as somewhat of a proxy war state or a buffer state in order to combat increased U.S. aggression within the Middle East. So, and you could say that that has many more impacts because Russia was a very powerful actor, that Russia expanded despite the many other nations, etc. So, being able to introduce a new actor either increases the gravity of the claim you're making or increases the vulnerability of the person receiving the claim that you're making and therefore can be very strategic. You could also introduce a new impact. And honestly, this is just the easiest thing to credit in the debate. It's, it's practically a new argument that is, that is just completely new. Um, the trouble only comes with weighing it out with other impacts. So let's say it's this house of man guns. On OG, you just argue um, people should have the ability to kill other people, like very simplistically. Um, they should not have the ability to arbitrate whether or not it is okay to take someone's life. It's very dangerous, etc. At CG, you could just say, well, what we do also is you reduce crime in a lot of high crime areas. And this is not just about one individual person doing it. It's about entire communities and how they deal with crime. Because it is often the sale of guns, even legally, precisely because you're unable to control how the transaction works, that it goes to a lot of organized crime members. It goes to a lot of individual like actions of crime that make use of guns, etc. And therefore, preventing crime is not only good because you stop people from dying, but you stop a whole load of other economic activities. You use guns to hold people up. You use guns to steal, etc., etc. And that's a new impact of the debate. Um, so really, you will have an extension if you have a new impact. It's really just a matter of how important is this new impact. You could also introduce a new part of the timeline. So you could look at, here's the short term, here's the medium term, here's the long term, and whatever else opening didn't argue. Or, whenever the motion is being enacted, you could say that it's a motion that changes through time. And you could see that now is either a uniquely good or a uniquely terrible time to enact the motion. So for example, uh, this house believes it is the interest of the Kremlin to take measures to reduce Russian dependency of China. And a whole lot of examples here, but that's pretty much the motion. OG just says, well, we can't really depend on China. They're a bad actor, etc." At CG, you could introduce the concept of time. So you could say, assuming China is a good actor, which is the worst case of OG that they never explained, I could explain at CG that actually China is a ticking time bomb. 
that their economy is based on an incredibly unsustainable method of development that relies on people being able to pay back loans when often they're defaulting, uh, which is why Chinese growth has stagnated massively since about the end of a lot of their One Belt, One Road projects. Because what's happening is China is paying a lot of loans, or rather giving out a lot of loans that people are unable to pay back. But the collateral of those loans, whether they be airports, um, train stations, etc., are either unfinished because the development project was never finished, or nobody really visits them, like some airports in Sri Lanka. And what that means is China handed out money, and that money went nowhere, nowhere and now it's worthless. So what we're doing by being able to reduce our dependence is right now we can stem the bleeding by reducing the Chinese benefits that we're getting. But in the future, what we're doing is we're saving ourselves from an economy that will eventually crash. And what that does is reduce a lot of the potential risk that exists towards us as the Russian government, and therefore is a benefit in the debate. So you have to explain, is the motion, if we're doing it now, is it being done at a uniquely important time to do it? Because otherwise there is no future in which we can do it. Or is it a uniquely good time for us to do uh, to do it because in the future it gets even better. So there's a converse to this. Some motions will ask you to do something now and you can say, now it's a good thing to do. But look at 20 years from now, it becomes even better. A good example of that would be most environmental motions. So now we might be able to stem some degree of the, like I guess, climate change, environmental harm that's happening. But in 30 years, what we're doing is saving ourselves from massive intensified natural disasters, from massive food scarcity, etc. We also introduce a change in scale. So there are two ways to do it. It's big to small or small to big. So it's opening been too focused on the large scale versus the individual people of impact. Or has opening been too focused on the micro and not considered the macro? Um, the first one I think is actually very true for debates that consider movements. So a lot of them will be like, ah, we should consider the long-term political change we get, but doesn't talk about the individual people who are going to be impacted as of this as a result, which is why the classic debate or bottle of like, well, you're using them as social battering rams is often quite effective because there's the like long-term potential that maybe the world changes, maybe the world gets more tolerant, but a lot of the time that comes at the cost of people today taking on a lot of harm, especially when they're already vulnerable. So maybe that would be engaging in a violent protest, right? Uh, there's room to argue on Gov, not just that violent protest doesn't change anything, but that it's just bad because people can't opt into it. It's bad because people are harmed by violent protests, etc. Conversely, you can say that opening has been too focused on the small scale and hasn't considered the large ma macro effects. And I'd say that's often the case for a lot of economic debates. Rather than just looking at individual economic actions, you want to look at how does this affect the overall strategy of development that a country or a region is going to be taking as a whole. So a nice example here is actually this house believes that the animal rights movement should oppose pet ownership. Um, I was in this debate before, and an extension was centered around this. Opening says, well, pets are often treated poorly. Uh, it's, I guess, if you believe in the rights of animals, it is analogous to slavery. It is uh, domestication without consent and all that kind of things, all those kinds of things. And I find these arguments quite compelling. I think that OG was quite good at being able to explain why. Um, we must be able to respect animal rights and therefore pet ownership is antagonistic to that. We should not support pet ownership. At closing government, what we did, however, is to explain it's not just about how individual animals are treated. It is also the industry of pet ownership as a whole that creates animals without their consent and forces them into a world only to subject them to become pets that they like and fulfill a purpose they were never originally consented to and i think the point of that is not just to say that they're animals now that are being harmed by the policy but that the entire industry is geared towards creating more and more and more animals and like uh i, I guess birthing them in ways that are dangerous and there are a lot of harmful practices to that right like there's a lot of harmful reproductive practices that they make animals do when they breed so they can get pets faster. 
that harms animals today, but also just the fact that these are animals being created for no other express purpose, no degree of autonomy whatsoever, rather than simply to become pets in the future. And that's why I should oppose the industry as a whole. Last is just introduce a new principle. So is there another principle that is either a higher moral value to follow or one more uniquely violated, or I guess in some cases, supported and encouraged by the motion? Meaning, do you have a principle that's more important or do you have a principle that is more uniquely impacted by the motion? So let's say, for example, the motion is, this house supports a social credit system. Opposition says, a social credit system offers increasing degrees of surveillance. It looks at your bank records. It has, if you look at places in which it is being implemented right now, it has face uh, recognition technology, it has tracking technology, etc. And maybe you could say on opposition that there's a right to privacy and there's a right to keep a lot of your own private records secure rather than consolidate them to be able to be used by governments. A principle you could argue with closing opposition is to say, look, uh, a lot of this stuff is information that could have otherwise been accessed, whether or not by governments or corporations, there's no difference. People are often not impacted at all by the surveillance that's being done onto them, especially because these are not things that really uh, like are changed by the way that surveillance gets you. So it's not like you're going to go to a different street just because there's a CCTV on it, stuff like that. So you play down the opening stuff. But you could introduce a new principle. You could say that people have a right to change. And the way to build that is you today is very, very different from you five years ago. In fact, you could argue that you today and you five years ago are completely different people for the reasons that you have completely different personalities different interests, different hobbies, et cetera, et cetera. What a social credit system does is because it rewards and punishes you based on your past behavior, it chains you to that past behavior rather than giving you the capacity to reform. So, and, and you could say that it's a compounding thing. Let's say, for example, your, a social credit system would often punish you for the crimes that you did. Let's say that you uh, stole money because you were desperate and you were economically disadvantaged. What a social credit system will do is it'll say you're a bad citizen because you stole money. It'll limit your access to public transport. It'll limit your access to bank services and financial institutions, etc. What happens overall is that, number one, there's a principal way to argue and say that your past actions should not define your future capabilities. And therefore, it's a dangerous precedence to follow. But moreover, it compounds you to your past because if you're already economically disadvantaged, now we're going to limit your access to state services. It's more likely you'll be even more economically disadvantaged because you can't access free public transportation, because you can't get a fair loan when you need it. And therefore, it makes you more likely to commit a lot of these same actions and limit your capacity to change as a whole. Um, and that's far more nuanced. That's far more important than just some random right to surveillance that opening argues then. So that's how I introduce a new principle. Uh, for the rest of this, we're going to be talking a bit about positioning, how to position in a debate and what you should be doing. Uh, we're going to do this in a couple of ways, actually. We're going to look at uh, specific teams, and then you can look at being able to target as a whole. So beating an opening, it's really just two things. You have to differentiate the extension, and you have to weigh it against the opening. The first thing, I promise you, every judge will see through this. Do not be disingenuous with what your opening team argued, especially if they are good. Meaning you can't say, well, they didn't actually argue this, and then you start arguing, but really they argued it, the judge will tell. And that's because like nine times out of 10, and that's being very generous already, they will know that you are a rehash if you are completely lying out of your face. So it actually really helps to be very explicit, actually, saying, here's where opening ended, here's where we're going to come in. And you don't even have to trash them. You can just say, opening argued this and this. These are valid. Here's where we're going to argue. Here's why that is better. Because what that does is it gives the judge a very honest interpretation of the debate that they probably already share, right? If your opening was indeed pretty good, the judge probably recognizes that. What you want to do is give the correct credence to them and therefore 
on that ground, you are still willing and able to beat them. And secondly, your differentiation and weighing will depend on the kind of extension that you had like decided to roll with. So if you're extending vertically, you again, you probably can't lie. Like you will have to say that you're going to argue a similar conclusion. But it's a matter of either explaining that your opening does not get that conclusion or that you prove why the conclusion is even better given a new mechanism, a new characterization, etc., that you're able to prove on your side of the debate. The second is you could extend horizontally, as I've said before. You have to explain why extension has a more important outcome. So just we say they argued A, we argue B, B is better than A. Uh, very straightforward, I think. Whenever you have a horizontal extension, it's really just a matter of being able to weigh it out there. Meaning the cross. Um, I think you do two things. You frame them in, then you frame them out. So if you know your OO or your OG is very good and your CG or CO, you want to explain that they're pretty good, actually. Because what you're doing is you're beating your opening. You say, wait, look. Oh, by the way, I'm explaining how to beat the team, assuming these teams are the stronger ones in the debate. So obviously, you want to try and beat the stronger teams in the debate if you want to take a first. So frame them in, and you say, oh, did this correctly. And what that does is it explains that your OG, if you're CG, did not do a very good job of responding to them. And therefore, OG at max takes like a third. That's very important, I think, because in a break round, you really only need a second. And being able to frame your OO in and saying, we're taking this ride along with you, and all the other teams fail to take this ride along with you, already kind of assures you hopefully take at least a second. So explain the failure of the other side. to respond. If you're a CO, you could also actually just explain that the CG, to an extent, also rehashed OG, which is why both OO and CG fall out of the debate. Now, you want to frame your extension as uniquely responsive to the case that already came out at OO or OG. And I think what that does is it makes it very strictly a two-team debate in the instance that these are the only good teams in the round. And you want to be very deliberate with this, and you want to be very clear with this, because not only do you frame your extension up, you bring OG and CO down, or the other way around. Meeting closing. I think meeting closing, you have to read the opposite extension. The first is, does it frame well with your extension? I.e., did you guys have the same reframe? Because if you guys do, the only way to beat them out is to simply out-argue, out-rebut, out-build them. It's a straightforward 1v1 debate, in my opinion. And the reason for that is, if you try and frame them out, you will be framed out along with them. You want to make sure you take them along for the ride. The second is, is it completely new framing? If so, you have to out-frame them. Make it look like they're kind of boxed out. Make them look engaging. Explain why the new extension might be new, but takes on a frame that is just far less important than other arguments that are argued within the debate. So, in so far as you have a lot of tools in your hand as to how to read the extension, you also your opposing extension team also has the same tools. How do you meet your opening? What you want to do often is you want to break deadlocks, and I think there are two ways to do this. The first is to argue something that is independent of the deadlock happening in the opening. Meaning, let's say opening is arguing about a characterization. Uh, OG says this person will act this way, or way A. OO says this person will act in way B. What you want to do is you want to give a new argument that is like, well, we don't really care whether they are characterized in way A or way B. This is a new argument that is independent of this clash, and therefore, you do not have to rely on a conditional or a, a maybe as to whether or not the benefit or outcome is likely to happen. And that's important because that kind of says OG and OO are now 50-50 chances of being believable. CG is where you have to roll. Same with your CO. Um, the second is simply to make an argument that introduces a goal that is more important. So OG says we achieve this. OO says we also achieve this, but better. At CG, you're going to say, well, we actually don't want to achieve that. Here's another goal. It's a more important goal. We win the debate. Um, how do you meet an opposing bench? I think this was very interesting because a lot of the time people forget how to respond, not just to both teams, but how to respond to both teams efficiently. And in my opinion, at member or even at whip, it becomes very difficult to respond to everyone all at the same time. And what you want to do then is respond efficiently by explaining 
what do both teams have in common? And then responding to a lot of this shared material. So you want to explain, here's the thing is op shares. They rely on the model to do both of their benefits. They rely on a shared context. They rely on shared premises. And take note, you don't even have to say that the closing team is a rehash. The closing team can have completely new conclusions, can have a completely new framing of the argument, etc. But by explaining what is shared, you are looking at the fundamental underpinnings of the argument and trying to logically disprove them, which means that you don't care if you're going with the original OO case or the UCO case. Both of them are disproven to the extent that you can effectively show the extension. And what you want to do is explain why the extension uniquely disproves a lot of these shared things. Maybe the model is ineffective. So even if O argues benefit A and CO says we get benefit B, if the model is ineffective at getting both, then gov wins. Or they have a shared context, and that context is actually either untrue or just not helpful towards their side. If they have shared premises, and even if the premises go towards different directions, if you can disprove that first premise, that means then that you're likely to win the debate overall. Uh, that's pretty much it for me. I uh, hope you learned a couple new things with that. Um, again, the end goal of this lecture is don't think of all these different distinctions or all these different strategies as they are all existing in isolation of one another. You will often have to look at mixes and matches of different strategies. You might find ones that are in the middle ground. All good. But I just want you to think about maybe I could extend on the timeline of this debate. Or maybe it's better to go for a horizontal extension in this kind of debate rather than a vertical one. And try to look not only for what is the new argument, but what is the strategic argument. And that goes back to my tip on prep for closing. Do not prep just for having a new argument. Prep the strategy that you're going to have. Prep the positioning you're going to want to be able to give. So don't just think about how am I going to build this. Think about how I'm going to frame this and position this in a way that is going to win the round. Uh, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, I guess, about anything, feel free to reach out to me. You can send a message request. I'll try to respond whenever I can or wherever this is posted, I guess. Uh, thank you.